Grab your goat. It's that time of the year. It's that time of the week. It is time for the Witches Movie Coven. Whee! I'm still waiting what we do on that moment. <laughs> witches talking about witches in movies. I am Patty Negri. I am one of your hosts. Um, you might, might know me from my Witching Hour podcast or Ghost Adventures or 8,000 other things on YouTube. But I am honored and thrilled to be part of this amazing team crew, or we call it Coven. I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, starting with Courtney, and let's go around in a circle. That's me. I'm Courtney Buckley. I am Ghost Bait on Scared and Alone, and I have someone, as you may be able to tell, to introduce you to tonight. Um, this is Black Philip with a butthole and no modesty, as we all have known, and this is his brand new twin brother, Black Philip, with two L's, who has no butthole and all the modesty that I was sent by our lovely producers so that I would finally give up this black Philip to Heather to sew his butthole closed. So now I have two for today. And she's still not going to give it up. She's still Probably not going to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Leal. That would be me. I'm Richard Leal. Richard Leal is one name, not two. If I were just Richard, I'd be a... You guessed it right. And some people like that. Some people like that word. And I am not here to judge anybody because sometimes that word can be a fun one. And I am known as the gentleman psychic. I am a psychic and a medium. I used to be a psychic and a small, but I gained weight. So no judgment. <laughs> but unlike other, other psychics here in New Orleans who are all doom and gloom or love and light, I am a happy medium. <laughs> and I, I am, I am on uh, from Ghost Adventures, and and you can find me University Magicus, and you can find me on my YouTube channel. I'm all over the. I'm I'm so easy to find. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Green, and I'm not my normal place. If you come, if you've joined our coven before, I am actually in Minneapolis. Um, I was at an event here over the weekend, Paganicon, and now there's my book. Yes, thank you, Courtney, for holding it up. I actually don't have a copy here. I'm in a hotel room, so we're going to hope the Wi-Fi holds out because I'm really excited to talk about this amazing movie. I know Courtney is, has lots to say about it, so I'm looking forward to it. But I am here in Minneapolis working at Llewellyn, where I am an editor, um, and I'm working at the offices, the, the mothership, so to speak, and also... Um, I am a journalist and covering occult stuff, and I wrote Lights, Camera, Witchcraft. So I am here and excited to talk about this movie this week. Thank you. And last and never least, Jason. Whoa. I'm Jason Makey. I've written a bunch of witchcraft books. This might be my favorite. The Horned God of the Witches, now in French. Woo-woo. Oh. Or as they would say in France, wee wee. So I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> about that i was at paganicon in minneapolis with heather over the weekend and i picked up a new friend in addition of course to having black Phillip. yay let's talk about this exciting happy spring equinox film yes yes this is yes happy equinox happy vernal equinox everyone ostara spring is sprung and we are talking about the crucible the 1996 film the Crucible. Now, if anybody hasn't seen it, Richard Lael, do you happen to have an unbiased synopsis of this lovely film? I <laughs> certainly do. So here is a lovely film. It was such a joy when it was over. Um, <laughs> this is from a plot line that was, it's, it's a fictitious retelling of the Salem witch trials. And it was in response to McCarthyism. And um, it's the story that has everything in it. If you were looking for a movie, this film has everything in it. It has screaming teenagers and it has inaccurate history and it has wonderful accents, which are not mm -hmm. so wonderful. And it has actors who take themselves way too seriously. And it has, um, what else does it have? Oh yes, the number one thing that I absolutely love, religious bigotry and zealotry. 
such a feel good movie for spring. <laughs> Thank you. Which trials fictionalized. Thank you so much. And now that we understand the movie, let's move over to Heather. Is this something that is in your book? It, it absolutely is because Salem, the Salem witch trials, which Courtney's going to illustrate later, because um, she sure. is the expert in the Salem history. But the Salem witch trials in movies became a, um, well, in American lore like no other from the moment Hollywood started. So Salem's, Salem's histories, what happened there, became is one of the most popular stories told about witches in American cinema. Is it told accurately every time? Absolutely not. And most movies do not tell it accurately. They either use it as a cue for a witch story, as a cue for, for this type of um, moral panic. There's so many from the moment Hollywood started, the most number, the, actually the silent era had the most number of Salem witch trials inspired stories. This one, um, well, and, and the most accurate one from what I, and, and Courtney might be able to speak to this better, was The Three Sovereigns of Sarah, which is a PBS story that was done during the 80s and it's largely considered the, the most accurate of all of them. Of course, it's PBS. It's not going to be as, as um, dramatic in Hollywood as most of the others. Um, but this one was based on The Crucible, The Crucible, the play, written by Arthur Miller, a famous playwright. Um, and although some of his other plays are Death of a Salesman, et cetera. He's a fantastic playwright. He also dated Marilyn Monroe, but that's another story. So he um, he wrote The Crucible in 19, early 1950s. It was produced and on stage 1953 for the first time and has since become his most produced play. Now I'm ta not talking about the movie. It was released during the McCarthy era this is the interesting part now. Now stick with me here on this history. It was released during the McCarthy era. And if you do not know what the McCarthy era is, it was a, it was a um, moral panic that happened that communists, the Reds, the commies were taking over the United States. It was a period of extreme conservatism. It was the same time that, well, Stalin was still in, in um, was, was at the end of his reign in Russia. He died in 1953. And he and the U.S. was terrified that the godless communists were going to take over the country. They, that's when they put in a, a, the God in our money. They put in God in the, in the Pledge of Allegiance. There was lots and lots of change. It was very conservative. Um, and it was, a, it was a moral panic. And a lot of people, especially Hollywood people, got blacklisted. They weren't able to, to work. So this movie was written then. It was written about a moral panic that was legend, myth, um, and part of our American fabric, okay? It came out, this movie came out in 96, 1996. This was the first time that, the, stick with me here, it's cool, this is the very first time that Arthur Miller's most famous, most produced play was ever came to the screen. This was the very first time. It never was on the silver screen until 1996. Why? Why in the world would that happen? So in 1996 um, was the end of the satanic panic, which is the um, uh, which is the end of the third biggest moral panic in our country. And Arthur Miller was asked when this movie came out if he wrote the original one about McCarthy era. He said, no, I just wrote it about moral panics in general. And they made a point, well, did it come out at this period of time because of the satanic panic? And he just shrugged it off. He said, I just wrote it about moral panics. It doesn't really matter what it's about. It's because moral panics, and I, I don't have my book to quote it exactly. He said something like moral panics are the fabric of, uh, of human beings and they're going to keep happening. Like it's not about any moral panic. It's about all mor moral panics. So that was back in the 90s. So it's a really interesting um pitting together of all of American history and all the different moral panics that there are. I'm not talking about the movie itself because the movie itself is, is inconsequential to that because that piece is really, really important. The importance of Salem in our history and our legacy and our culture is so important beyond the actual history, which Courtney will speak to. And, and the fact that Arthur Miller was pinning this. And now we're talking about it now during the middle of another moral panic. So I think that's 
that's really, really important. It's, this movie may not be great, but Arthur Miller's story and the Salem legacy and the, what, has, what has happened is very important right now. I'm ending it right there and I'm moving on. Oh no, you guys can talk now. Because I've said these. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Uh, Jason. Oh no, I just wanted to hear Courtney. That's that's what yeah. I'm waiting okay, on. Courtney. That's what we're no all Courtney. About. No Courtney. I don't know why you would be excited because I have, first of all, I'll take up half the show here. I'll try to, to tone it down. But here's the thing. So as we all know from all the other movies we watched, the Salem bit that everybody does in a movie drives me insane because it's always inaccurate which leads to people coming to Salem and thinking that it's accurate or asking questions about it this movie is the cult, like just the the big kahuna of all of that right so this is the one I have until tonight I had not watched this movie since I was forced to watch it when I was forced to read the play in high school so I didn't have a very strong recollection of it other than the fact that when I was actively giving tours, one of the most common questions I got was how accurate was the crucible or questions about John Proctor having an affair and all this stuff. Like, it's just, it was the bane of my existence without even remembering why it was the bane of my existence. So all day long, I've been stressed and I have been worried about how I was going to react watching this movie again for the first time since high school. And I'll tell you, I did not expect my own reaction. I watched it. Not only I, I did expect to get angry. I did. I got very angry. I was hate texting Richard Lale about it um, while I was watching. And, but then I, I was motivated to get up and do research for today. So I have a whole, I have three pages of notes. And while I was taking these notes, I was emotional. I was really emotional because I feel like, Heather, I, I see and understand why this movie is important because what it talks about is important and the Salem Witch Trials are important. But what this movie did to the memory of these people who were not actual witches, who were innocent people, it's heartbreaking. So I did. I have some things to present tonight, not right now, that... I feel like we'll bring that justice back. Can I just can I just say is I don't I didn't say that this movie was important. Or the wanted, story, I'm sorry. Yeah, I I what I said was the the lessons and the story of the Salem witch trials in our history is what's important. Right. Not this particular movie. I would like to see you know that's what's important in the fact that that we're continuing to have moral panics time and time again. And Salem's history is what's important. Is what I meant. Sorry. No, and that's totally valid. I'm also very heated because of all of this. So I'm that was me miss saying what it was that I'm I knew what you meant and I miss said it. So that's my apologies on that. Um there was I'm gonna start with real quick the things that they got right because there's not a lot of them. Um, but I feel like in an effort to be fair to this, I will try that. Um, so if you can just give me one second here so I can pull up my list. Um, so the hysteria a little bit, that's, that is what that was like. That, that is how that escalated. Um, the whatever in the woods, what they were doing did not actually happen. Um, and I'm like shaking. I don't know if you can hear it in my voice. I'm like so upset. Um, the shaking in the woods, I mean the, sh the, the, the ritual that they did in the woods, was not real but the way that it escalated where they thought they were going to be in trouble they were trying to keep each other quiet kind of a thing and then the the hysteria takes hold and, it, and everybody's so afraid at this point because of what world they lived in that even just the slight mention of this and it, it it goes like a brush fire so the hysteria as a concept was a little bit on on task there um tichuba confessing to save herself that was real um she was smart because she did do that she was one of the first accused they said that they were doing something with tituba um she confessed and gave names and that's where the her confession her saying yes i did this and here's 
the proof, which was her just telling other names, that was sort of added fuel to the fire, so to speak, of the hysteria, because now they have something real, they thought. Um, uh, I think that was it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The names, some of the names were real, like, but that's the part that drives me nuts because they use real names and they didn't do real things with them. And Giles Corey had his last words were real. More weight. Yeah. More weight. Yeah, okay. he was pressed to death, right? Yeah. Correct. But his whole story, I mean, he did accuse his wife of witchcraft and she hanged for it. Um, yeah. But, I mean, there was a quote um, that Hale, Reverend Hale, says, uh, you know, the devil cannot overcome a minister, don't you? And I screamed out loud, and I had to stop the movie to, like, hate write a paragraph, because in the actual witch trials, the, they did not believe that. The George Burroughs um, was a minister and they believed that he was they called him i think like the um like king of hell or something that they thought he was satan himself holding the book for them to all sign their names in they accused him of this and he was a minister and when he stood on the gallows he recited the lord's prayer from start to finish without making a mistake which they believed could not happen so now there's uproar because how we're executing an innocent man and, and we have to let him go and he did the thing and you know whatever but the powers to be were like aha except he's the devil so he gave himself the power to trick us and he was executed anyway like this was these things were brutal and horrible and the way that these people were treated wasn't fair and I feel like to me I understand what the the play what the movie was trying to do but to use their actual names and not tell their real stories is a disservice i think i have a whole list i have everyone's name here and something about them all um so, <clears throat> okay well so there's hold on let me pull my notes over here this is what i was like crying looking up 14 women and five men were executed. They were hanged during the trials. Giles Corey was pressed to death. Um, on June 10th of, 19, of 1692, I'm dyslexic with numbers, sorry. Um, June 10th of 1692, Bridget Bishop, who is about age 60, she's the first to be tried and executed. She's often confused with Sarah Wilds, who um, was executed a month later. Uh, executed July 19th, 1692, Rebecca Nurse, age 71, um, she was like a God-fearing woman. She was considered a pillar of the community. Um, 39 respected community, community members signed a petition to defend her, and it didn't work. Um, she was actually found innocent at first, and then uh, because no one could believe that she would consort with the devil because of how God-fearing she was. And the court came back and said well you know if if you are looking at this woman who clearly has consorted with the devil and you are coming to her defense we might have to look at you and consider why it is that you're saying that so they encouraged the jury to re-deliberate and they came back with a guilty verdict um so she was executed at age 71 sarah good age 46 she was a homeless beggar um she would walk around the streets like muttering under her breath she was you know, probably mentally ill, sadly. Uh, Elizabeth Howe was in her late 50s. Um, her husband's brother accused her. Uh, she was accused of afflicting a neighbor's child and livestock. Susanna Martin, age 70. She was a widow. Um, she had been previously accused and exonerated of witchcraft. Sarah Wilds, age 65, previously tried on accusations of adultery and wearing a silk scarf. Um, and she was in a long-running feud with her first husband's family. On August 19th, 1692, George Burroughs, who I just spoke about, was executed. Uh, he was previously the minister of Salem Village. Um, he was arrested in Maine and brought back. Uh, George Jacob Sr., he was in his early 70s. He was arrested along with his granddaughter, who was spared after accusing him. Martha Carrier, age 38, um, she was accused in um, conjunction with George Burroughs as being the queen of hell while he was the king of hell. 
On August 19th, 1692, John Proctor, age 60, um, he was arrested after coming to his wife's defense. And he was very outspoken about how ridiculous he thought the trials were, that it wasn't real, that they were, um, you know, people were making things up. Um, John Willard, age 35, deputy constable, um, he refused to arrest those he believed to be innocent, and he was executed on the same day as John Proctor. On September 22nd, 1692, Martha Corey, um, who was the wife of Giles Corey, she was also outspoken against the trials. Uh, she was executed. Mary Easty, age 58, she was the sister of Rebecca Nurse. Um, uh, she was also a very godly woman, supposedly. Mary Parker um, claimed to have been arrested in a case of mistaken identity. Alice Parker, accused by Mary Warren of killing her mother. And I'm going to mess up this name. Anne Pudater, I think is how you say it, 70s. She was in her 70s, worked as a midwife. Uh, and Wilmot Red was an irritable woman, much like I am today. Um, was in her 70s and was executed. <laughs> Margaret Scott. Margaret Scott in her late 70s was a widow. Um, she was a beggar. She lost, she suffered with um, infertility, lost a lot of, of children um, in infancy. Samuel Wardwell, senior, age 49, arrested along with his wife and daughter. Um, he recanted his forced confession and then was executed. Um, and then backing up a little bit on September 19th, uh, 1692 is when Giles Corey was pressed to death during his, um, he did not, he didn't stay on trial. He wouldn't admit to being a witch. They were trying to get him to confess. And so they kept placing, they put him, uh, face up in a little ditch with a board on top of him and put rocks on top of him and piled and piled and piled and tortured him for two days until he succumbed to his injuries. Um, and of course, yes, his last words being, more weight. I also have a list of children accused and people who died in jail. Um, I don't know how many people know this. Uh, this was one of my favorite stories to tell on tour because not because it was a good story, but because it was so heartbreaking that it really brought people back to reality of why we were standing where we were standing. Um, the youngest person to be imprisoned for witchcraft in 1692 was four years old. Uh, she was the daughter of Sarah Good. Um, her name was Dorothy Good. Some of the transcripts read as Dorcas. Um, so there's, you hear her called both ways. Um, she was, she went, she was in jail for nine months, uh, until she was released and had lasting mental health issues from that for the rest of her life, which she died in her teens. So not very long. Uh, Thomas and Sarah Carrier, age 10 and seven, with the children of Martha Carrier, Abigail Johnson, age 11, Mar Margaret, Toothaker, age 10, Dorothy and Abigail Faulkner, age 10 and 8, jo uh, Joanna Tyler, age 11. Um, most of these were children of people, children or relatives of people who had been accused as well. Um, and then we have Lydia Dustin in her late 60s, died in jail. She was exonerated, but the most infuriating part of this whole thing is that when they were in jail, if they were exonerated or at the end of the trials, they were not released from the horrible conditions that they were kept in just by waving a magic wand. They had to pay their jail fees, which included room and board and food, which they didn't get a lot of. Um, so she was exonerated, but she couldn't be released from jail because she couldn't afford her, her jail fees. Um, and then Ann Foster, age 75, um, she confessed and was likely tortured in prison. Mercy Good, who, uh, when Sarah Good was arrested, she was pregnant. Mercy Good was her newborn, um, born in jail and died before her mother was executed. Um, Sarah Osborne, age 49, um, was one of the first three women accused. She never um, stood trial because she died in jail. And Roger Toothaker, age 57. So I just thought, you know, before we talk about any of this having to do with the movie and make jokes and whatever that is really important to remember the people that actually lost their lives. These were real people and they didn't do what they were accused of doing. They were innocent and it was a lot. So okay. I got really emotional looking at that. So that's, that's my piece for now. Can, can I just jump in? And I appreciate you said that. Um, 
And um, I have like 10 different things that you spurned in my head thinking about, you know, and the importance of what you're doing and the importance of this importance of using the Salem story as allegory. But besides that, aside from all of the thoughts and the feels, thank you, Courtney, for doing that. I wanted to just tell a quick little story is that sometime in 2012, I wound up with about 80 other modern witches, Wiccans of different types in Salem. Um, we were staying at the Hawthorne Hotel, hotel and um, we were, there's a, there's a big field, Courtney, you probably know what it's called, a park or field or something big grass area that's not far from the Hawthorne. So Salem and, Common. Okay, thank you. And we did a massive, massive ritual because we we're having three days of events. And this was way back. And someone said during the thing, we're going to go over to tell me the name of it, where they actually had the little monuments. It's a little, it's the little the, place. The witch trial memorial, the which memorial. actually I believe Arthur Miller attended at the unveiling of that. Well, this was not when Arthur Miller was there. This was, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, um, we went over there and we actually did a memorial ritual to all of those people. We said their names and we walked around and put a flower on each one of their memorials. And we, we thanked them for their lives and we did a whole, and it was extremely emotional because we can, and I was just talking this at a lecture that I did over the weekend, that even though we are choosing to use the word witch and we can exist, using that word and we are we may get harmed we there's people in the world that might want to take our jobs from us or not let her you know belittle our children or whatever we are not being hanged and and not everybody had that choice a lot of people entered the space of the witch unwittingly when unwittingly and so we need to honor them so in, in 2012 there was a bunch of crazy wiccans who were who were over there doing like 80 of us crammed in doing a, a ritual to honor those people and their names and say their names and and know that we know that you were not supposed to be called witches, but this is what happened to you. So it is important. And I completely agree. And I thank you for doing what you just did. Well, and see, and I think that that is the beauty of Salem today, which is that us witches who are witches give that back to them. You know, we honor their memory by being able to be who we are. And it's a place where we've can congregate and are welcomed and you know the fact that it took their death to give us that but like every witch that i know gives something back when they go so yeah. i i think that there is beauty in that that it's become a place that's become so accepting of people for who they are and yes you're gonna have you know people who don't feel that same way wherever you go but for the most part it's a very accepting place and I think that's you know they they were innocent and they didn't deserve it but at the same time after this many years if this is what their legacy was you know that's not so bad but when we do things and I just want to touch on um, Jason, actually, you in the comments saying that I, I think that the problem is that these were real people. So when we attach fictional or inaccurate narratives to them, we take away a bit of their humanity. Like, that's what bothers me. Exactly. Like, nail on the head. That's what bothers me. Because we as witches, we do things. That's the... Okay, so I know I'm going to get emotional. That um, is the memorial that is at Proctor's Ledge, which is where the actual hangings took place. Um, so everyone has a name in the back there. You can see the little stones. They have names on them, um, except Giles Corey because he was not executed there. But when you stand there, it is breathtaking and not in a good way necessarily. It is in a way that like it's it's like walking into the memory where you can see the place as it was, where you can see how they hanged their bodies and left them on display to be an example for other people to not consort with the devil or do these awful things that they were these things that they deemed as awful but then the just disrespect to their memory they weren't buried in cemeteries they weren't given a proper burial they weren't given a gravestone their family had nowhere to go to grieve them because they were dumped into what was called witch pit at the base of that hill right there that was in that picture and and you know some of the family members did sneak onto the land and, and steal their bodies away and bury them privately but you know descendants of these people don't really have a place to go 
to visit them because that and that's why we have the memorial because there's nowhere else for them to go because we don't know where they are to this day we don't know where they are and it's it's it it's dehum it is dehumanizing like it's just so i think jason thank you for saying that because that that's exactly it that is exactly my problem with this is that they deserve their stories to be told or or tell the story but make it different like you know i i feel like have I don't you know. seen Three Sovereigns for Sarah? Not yet. I, no. I I have to watch that. Yeah, it's a PBS one. It's extremely excruciating, and and it's told from a survivor's perspective and having her sisters killed. So it's a totally. It's not based on the, the play at all. But mm -hmm. most of the most of the movies are not based on the play. They're based on Salem's alleged history or inspired by Salem. It's 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 not. This is the only one that's actually based on the play. So yeah. see Sovereigns for Sarah. I'd be really curious to hear what you have to say about that. I'm I'm interested to watch it. Mm -hmm. So that's, guys, let me step back off my soapbox. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I said most of what I wanted to say for right now. I have something else for later. But thank you for giving me a minute to do that because that meant a lot to me. And that feels like whatever disservice I feel like I did by watching that movie and paying Two ninety nine for it. Like, send. Tell me who to send an invoice to because. But whatever disservice I did by that, I I was able to just make right. So thank you. And thank with that, you. we're out of time. Thanks for watching the Witches movie. <laughs> <Seven. laughs> I we'll warned everybody. I was gonna go late. I was gonna make us go late. I warned. I warned everybody. So it, it's okay. You can have my time, Courtney. Completely. You can have my time on this. Um. I could not even get through the whole thing because of just stuff going on in my life. I'd watch bits and pieces and go, okay, that's enough. <laughs> so I, it's been a long time since I've seen it. So you have all my time. You get so, <laughs> good. I wasn't allowed to watch it as a child. Not, I mean the play even I, the, the play I was not allowed to watch as a child. Wow. And then when the film came out, I, I mean, I was, I was, I was a teenager and didn't really want to watch it anyway. Um, it'll kind of like Harry Potter. I wasn't allowed to watch Harry Potter. And then it's for the same reasons. It has witches in it. And then, you know, I, I sent producer Rob there. I don't know if you remember the chick tracks that were handed out every Halloween. And th there, there are some little clips or some little images. I can't remember the one where they actually paint uh, Tichaba as an actual witch and that she had possessed these children and caused them to, I, 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 I wasn't even allowed to watch it, but as a, an out gay satanic witch, I, I, I do know also from having come from religious zealotry from, from a, 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 a religion that was, it was my daily life. It was everything and if there was a woman who had clothing that was her, you know, her ankles were exposed or if um, it, it, I know, right. Bad. <laughs> it was awful. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand how that in these groups that they, they get this sort of um, what is that feedback feedback loop? They always have the same sort of everyone that they know does it. Everyone that everyone in their, their circle does it. But in a modern day, from the other side, I get I get death threats weekly. Not as much as it used to be. It used to be daily. I would get two or three or four. Now it's only weekly. But also, I don't check my emails. So <laughs> that's how I that's how I stopped that one. But I was getting I was I was quite literally getting these threats daily, and even whether it be via email or or even driving down the street you know my car is mr satan and i sometimes sport these lovely horns and uh, you know i am i am now considered in league with the devil himself and people take it upon their upon themselves to preach to me and tell me that i need to find their perspective God. And I write back and tell them, no, you need to find your God. I don't think so. I don't want it. I'm not harming anybody. You just do whatever you want to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to step over here and, and hail Satan and hail myself, you know? Yeah. 
<laughs> no, I'm, I mean, me being a public person and you, oh yeah, you're scary Richard Leal with a dog. <laughs> I'm a good witch, Patty. I'm about as scary as, well, this Black Phillip. I get them too. I get stuff. I mean, a lot of people are thinking why I'm hacked right now on Facebook is somebody just didn't like my evil witchness. It's like, have you watched my evil witchness? You find the <laughs> evil, you get three points. <laughs> so it's still out there. It's still out there. I mean, that's something that I used to stress on tours a lot uh, is that, you know, especially in October, I would I would tell people like, look, us at, at the jail where like a lot of horrors took place. And I tell the story about Dorothy Good or Dorcas Good, or whatever you want to whatever you believe her name is. Um, but I would tell that story and I would be like, listen, like, I don't tell you this to like ruin your good time. But you know, we all love that everyone comes to Salem in October. We all love that everyone enjoys the Halloween spirit. We all love Salem for what it is today. But it's important to remember, like, not only why we're here because of what happened to these real people, but also that things like this are still happening around the world. Right. Like, there right. are cultures where people are still being accused and executed or or um, excommunicated from their, from their only home that they've ever known because of nonsense sure. like this. And it's just ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous that we, it's 2024 and this is still happening and we've learned nothing. And that, I did a whole a work a workshop this weekend called In Search of the Witch to define what that is and look at it through history. Um, I, Salem was was a note just to, to kind of put it in context, but um, I think that, you know, I'm going to get to, I want to get back to the movie in a second because someone put something in the message that, I, uh, in the, comments that was important but i think the that sale the legend not the legend it's the wrong word the story of salem and what it's become has become more than its history and the history you have to hold on to the history i'm a historian so absolutely courtney you have to hold those these are real people you have to hold the history correctly because of the people and what actually happened absolutely but salem's transcended that it's a message and that is what Arthur Miller was doing with his play. So I will defend his play because his message is very, um, it's not the movie. And this is where I get back to it. The movie was Hollywood's spin on trying to make his message, what he was trying to do with the play during the McCarthy era, which was a warning against extremism and a warning against moral panic. He was trying to use bits and pieces in a tiny little play that can encompass what really happened. He took this tiny little story to create this, to warn, even though he says it wasn't about the McCarthy era, even if you say it was just a warning against moral panic, because like he says, it's, he, he said something so great. He said, the, because the evil, he said something like, I made this play because the evil is not without, it's within. And he was saying that we keep having these moral panics. He, it was a brilliant statement. So I don't think that the play is as much the problem because it, it is tapping into the, the sheer power and importance of why we can never forget what happened in Salem. And that is why it's transcended. It's, it's almost a spiritual mes message. The movie failed to capture that. The movie failed. It, it took the story of the play and tried to make a Hollywood like kind of like, I don't know, Jerry Springer thing. Um, so it failed to do it and they haven't done the crucible. Um, it's, it, I would love to see somebody do it right. I would love to see somebody tell the story right without it seeming like a PBS historical story to tell the story. I don't know if that's possible, but that is, that is why this movie failed in my opinion, because it really didn't capture the point of what Arthur Miller was doing plays Plays are like can be like poetry where they try to aim at a at a, an essence. And Salem has transcended just for the very reason that you're speaking about. And we need to capture it and we need to keep telling Salem's story. We need to keep telling it, especially right now in this day and age, because like someone said, it doesn't it hasn't ended. It hasn't ended. It keeps rearing its ugly head, this moral panic stuff. But someone put in the I think it was Mary Jane King said. That isn't that why in the witch, um, uh, they left their place. Actually, what's funny about the witch is they they left their Salem esque town that was having a moral panic because the family was even more 
religiously extremist than the town. So they, it's actually the opposite. Um, they didn't leave because they were, because the town was too extremist. They left because they were, they were kicked out because they were too extremist, which is what starts off the movie of the witch, which is probably one of the best witch, witch movies ever made, but that's, that's another thing. So Jason, you haven't spoken at all. Cat got you. Go got this is done. great. I do think it's worth pointing out that Arthur Miller wrote this screenplay. So if this movie does not capture what he wants to say, it cannot be just blamed on Hollywood. Though watching the film, I thought it was dour. It looked cheap to me. I mean, obviously, it's not a feel-good story by any means, but I didn't like the direction at all. I just didn't. I mean, as somebody who likes movies, there was nothing that was visually captivating. I, it just felt very bland to me the whole way through. He he might have written it. He he did write it. He he was involved to some degree, but he was not the editor. He was not the director. He was not the lighter. He was not the costume designer. And he didn't pan it at the end. So he wasn't. He didn't hate it. Um, and I think it was because it was reaction to Satanic Panic. But I don't. But and 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 he was older. And maybe he thinks it did capture it. But I don't say it did. And if I was and I've directed theater myself. I've directed theater on New York in New York off Broadway. And it, it, this does not capture what I would have done with the play. And I was in the play. I was actually Elizabeth Proctor in, Holly, in, in college. So no, he failed. And maybe it's because I'm a witch and maybe because it's, I know it's this, this, this history and now I've been schooled even more by Courtney Buckley that if I was to do <laughs> Arthur Miller's play, it would, it would be Miller's play with the spirit behind what Courtney Buckley said. So, so I, I have a question about the movie. Whose creative decision was it to have these people act as if they were in 1692 with whatever version of English accent that was <laughs> mixed mixed with a Boston accent sometimes? <laughs> I thought I was going to tear out my eyeballs, my eardrums. I was feeling violent while I was watching this because that struck a nerve big time. That's the director. Also, for me, that was what a struck a nerve was the costuming was awful it was so bad the costuming was so like the ladies are okay you could there's there's a little bit there the ministers are okay it's it's like this is what is this western garbage <laughs> i don't know what that's supposed to be <laughs> and there's quaker Oats guy right there oh my god <laughs> Not Quaker Roads. <laughs> you can't have a 90s movie without her in it, Winona Ryder. No. <clears throat> yeah, it was the the accent. Every time the Boston accent would creep in and they would forget an R here or there, I was like, oh, call the police. <laughs> Do not. Ironically, we have to point out that 1996 was the year the craft came out. So when I write in my book, I talk about this, is that this was the banner year for this for the turn of movies and witchcraft. So prior to 1996, you had all of the witch, witchcraft is evil movies and women are out to get all the women witches are out to get. And then 1996 comes, you have the craft, you have the, the crucible comes out about moral panic and everybody needs to chill out. And then you have the craft where witchcraft and Wicca is good. And then you have a total turn. It's like it almost about face on the representation. So the crucible and the craft are the two. 1996 is the year. It's kind of interesting. So I'm such an, a nerd for dates and little details like that. <laughs> so it's it's another note. doesn't make the crucible movie any better. It's just a point. <laughs> you know what could have made it better is if there was an actual devil or a black Philip. I would have been fine with a black Philip. It's well, fictional we anyway. We got that movie. I know that was true. It was a good. It was the best. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Here he is. Yay. Oh so, where are Jason, we? you must have something to say. You've been so quiet. I'm. I'm curious. Uh, I mean, you, it's hard to tell jokes about a movie <laughs> where 19 people die who were real people at the end of the film. I mean, it's just. You know, this is just a depressing movie. And as a piece of filmmaking, I don't like it very much either. You know, you can tell a sad story and tell it well. I don't think this movie tells the story very well, even with the artistic licenses that Courtney disagrees with. And I disagree with too. I hate it when real historical figures are changed to fit a movie narrative. 
you know, but it just, it's just not good and it's hard to make fun of. So I'm, I'm really at a loss when it comes to that. The jokes just don't flow very well. And I like Winona Ryder too much to just mm-hmm. mock her the whole way through because Jim, Winona Ryder is like the Generation X actress, right? Like She yes. ruled the 90s. And then just like the rest of us in 2001, got caught for shoplifting. But, you know, we're willing to forgive her for that. Because there, it happened to the rest Jay's of us, too. Back. I can't wait to hear your, your movie minute. Yes. I'm sure it's going to be a good one. Oh, man. I, Do, I almost thought about just rereading the Kiki's Delivery Service one for Courtney there at the beginning of the well, show. Well, oh, it, we should mention that... Um, I laughed so hard at the Kiki's Delivery Service one last week that I then sent a text so that Jason can have a screenshot as proof that I relinquished my hex regarding the Princess Bride because I feel like he redeemed himself. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Attracted. Yeah. And then um, Colin keeps asking how many people got hexed while I was watching this. Anyone that was involved with this movie. So, a lot. It was exhausting. Did you? Did you- can you not hex Arthur Miller because he is a really he's a good playwright? Fine. Let <laughs> everyone else go that ruined the vision. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll do be it. nice to Winona Ryder. Some of the choices and Winona Ryder too. I, mean, I do she, not she, think we're her own, right? She's just doing fine. the bidding of her director. Please, please because she's in Stranger Things too, and she is the general. All right, all right. Actor. Leave her alone. How about I'll leave the actors alone because it wasn't their fault. They were just doing what they were told. But anyone that had any any kind of decision making on this venture is gonna get it. In just like Jason, like this. On that note, do you have quotes, Courtney? Okay, so here's what I did. Um, I do have quotes. It was very difficult for me to, uh, but again, I tried really hard to find. Just like I tried really hard to find. Um, positives or things that they got right in this movie. I I tried really hard to find some quotes that I didn't feel super guilty writing down. Um, so I'm gonna read those, but then I have something else after. Um, so I I talked about one where I said, you know, the Hale said, yeah, you know, the devil cannot overcome a minister. Um, when Martha Corey stands up in court and laughs, and they said, how dare you mock them, Martha Corey? And she said, what else are fools good for? And I wrote that down because I, that's what I thought about who made this movie. Mm. Um, <clears throat> then John Proctor uh, is talking about um, Winona Ryder, whatever her name is in this movie, um, making up the accusations. And he says, for this is a whore's vengeance now. Uh, and I felt like I had to write that down because I felt like that's, I was being personally attacked by this movie and I felt like this movie was a whore's vengeance. So um, at the end when she goes to the jail and is begging him to come on the ship uh, in Boston Harbor and he says, it's, oh, Abigail, it's not on a ship. We'll meet again, Abigail. It's in hell. And I thought that's where we all are right now at this point in this movie. Um, Someone said, Mr. Harris, you're a brainless man. And I thought valid. Um, the, the quote, I wrote it down after, Heather, that we were talking about, um, where it said, hold on, I just lost my whole screen. Yeah, I'm uh, going to use this one. <laughs> I wrote it down after we talked about it. Oh, Elizabeth, your justice would freeze beer. Um, and then, of course, the whole uh, scene at the end where John Proctor was ripping up the confession that he signed and screaming, it's my name! I thought it was like super dramatic. But I feel like that whole thing... Um, I didn't really talk about this, uh, you know, as part of it earlier, but that whole thing is kind of one of the things that they got right. He did stand up for that. He didn't, he felt like it was an injustice. He didn't want to, um, he didn't believe that what they were doing was right. So he did, he did stand up. So um, we can give him all that, a little, uh, you know, give them a little credit for at least getting that part. Um, so then the other thing that I did, those are my movie quotes. Um, but I was really upset again. Um, so what I did instead was I went and found quotes from the victims and I thought I could read some of those because I feel like their words are more important. Um, Martha Corey said, I am an innocent person. I never had to do with witchcraft since I was born. I'm a gospel woman. Um, Mary Estee said, the Lord above knows my innocence as at the great day 
when be known to men and angels. I petition your honors not for my own life, for I know I must die, and my appointed time is set. But the Lord, he knows He knows it is that if it be possible, no more innocent blood may be shed. Um, she wrote that in prison while awaiting execution. Uh, Elizabeth Howe said, if it was the last moment I was to live, God knows I am innocent. Um, George Jacobs Sr. wrote, well, burn me or hang me. I will stand in the truth of Christ. Susanna Martin um, said, amen, amen. A false tongue will never make a guilty person. Rebecca Nurse said, I can say before my eternal father, I am innocent and God will clear my innocency. Um, John Willard said, I fear not, but the Lord in his due time will make me as white as snow. And then um, John Proctor himself wrote um, a letter uh, while in prison begging them to reconsider and not just save his own life, but to save everyone's life. Um, and he said, the magistrates, ministers, juries, and all the people in general being so much enraged and incensed against us by the delusion of the devil, which we can term no other, by reason we know in our consciences we are all innocent persons. And I think that that was really powerful and speaks to who he really was. So those Thank are my quotes. I, I, do have a, I do have a comment, though, about John Proctor. Um, the actor who played John Proctor, playing John Proctor is a gamble. Proctor and Gamble is a... It's quite a it's quite a gamble that Proctor. <laughs> <laughs> Which turn off your light. Richard Lyle, turn your light off. Craft. It has to be <laughs> craft because remember during the satanic panic, Proctor and Gamble had a moon, and they the, the one extremist group of people said that Proctor and Gamble was into witchcraft. That's that's You're my making I'm, connections. You are making connections. Are you turning your light off? No. Are you? Yep, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Did Courtney As do you that should. with her? Did Courtney do that with her mind for Massachusetts? That's what I want mm -hmm. to know. I yeah. sure did. That's <laughs> impressive. All it's right, the New Orleans connection. <laughs> As we are moving on in time, Jason, you, I did write something. You better believe it. So okay. um, here we go. Uh, hopefully some of you will recognize this intro in the Salem criminal justice system. The people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. The hysterical girls who accuse people of witchcraft and the judges who have already made up their minds that half of their town are witches in league with the devil. The crucible is their story. How does one <laughs> tell jokes about a movie when that movie ends with 19 innocent people dead all of whom are historical figures. Sure, one could criticize the ever fluctuating accent of one Winona writer. Sometimes <laughs> she sounds like a proper English lady, other times like a refugee from the deepest, most remote, remote parts of West Virginia. But that feels <laughs> like low hanging fruit. Perhaps I could make jokes about a then 25 year old Winona writer leading the children of Salem Village when she's obviously an adult. Who will think of the children? Who will think of the audience who has to endure such a charade? I love Winona Ryder, but she's most certainly a messy eater, as evidenced by the chicken blood running down her chin in the mo movie's opening scene. But perhaps the easiest jokes come from the judicial reasoning used by the religious zealots of Salem. Actual quote from the movie. In an ordinary crime, witnesses are called to prove guilt or innocence. But witchcraft is an invisible crime. Therefore, who may witness it? The witch, of course, and the victim. Now, we cannot expect the witch to accuse herself, can we? Therefore, we may only rely upon her victims, and the children certainly testify. This is all very similar to some other judicial, judicial reasoning we were recently exposed to. What do you burn apart from witches? Wood. So why do witches burn? Because they're made of wood. Good. So how do we tell if she is made of wood? Does wood sink in water? No. Wood also floats in water. A duck. Exactly. So, <laughs> logically, if she weighs the same as a duck, she's made of wood and therefore rich. As the crucible does not lend itself to easy jokes, and Arthur Miller's play slash screenplay is not an accurate retelling of the events 400 years ago, Miller's play was originally an indictment of the Red Scare that ruined the lives of thousands of people 
believed to be socialists are thought to be consorting with the Communist Party. Today, similar scares are targeting people of color, immigrants, and the LGBTQ plus community. It is not a stretch to think that such hysteria might affect the witchcraft community too. The crucible is a reminder to be vigilant, vigilant and to speak out against injustices and untruths. So mote it be. So mote it be. That was good. I just want to point out, which which I didn't say earlier, just real quick, is that the play and the movie are not the same. They are. I, I will continue to defend the play. The movie he rewrote it. The screenplay does not is not mere a, an exact replica of the play at all. So if you read the play, everyone, if you if you're interested, go see a good rendition of it and read the play. I can I also just real quick one thing I forgot to point out is that John Proctor in real life was in his 60s and Abigail in real life was like 12. Yeah. 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 None of that was going on. That's that's a weird Nobody thing. wants to see that in a film though. Ooh. Nope. Gross. No. Gross. no. Unless you make me watch The Witch That Came From the Sea. Yeah. And then we will see that in a film. We can go we we should do that movie just for another uh, fun with Courtney uh episode. Yes. Listen, I don't think I think a lot of people are gonna be mad at us if we try to make them watch that because that is <laughs> after triggering. after the crucible. I want to watch the killing tree again. I mean that's, <laughs> that's how rough this was for me. We need something light. Uh, we need something light. But we have one more thing to do before we go. We have to vote. Wands up, wands down, wands. <laughs> what's going on with your wand i don't know i won't come off my cording <laughs> oh well I, I it won't come off <laughs> wait okay <gasps> down 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 I'm, I'm down for the movie but i'm up for the message and for courtney Me History. Up for them. That's yeah. why I didn't up go for the message. I went up here. for the message and for Courtney's history. And oh, down down the, movie. Movie. the movie is down. I am holding a pen because the pen is mightier. And when autocrats come to power, they attack freedom of speech, they attack the freedom of press. The pen is mightier. Up, Beautiful. up for your message. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so hi Lisa. So we got downs, we got downs. The movie was half ass. Um, we <laughs> yes. don't have any ups. We've got a neutral down. Mine was a neutral down just be again because of the message and because of the yeah. Um, but within it, but what are we watching next week other than the crucible? The, the house with a clock in its walls. The house with a clock in its walls. Yes. Don't say oh, it too quickly now. Man, do I need this movie. I am, yeah. <laughs> Guys, it's it's rough over here. Yeah, we're going to get away time. from Salem for a while. Uh, you know, not physically. Obviously, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Can I just really quick, like, say one more time. Thank you, every all my coven mates here, everyone in the comments. I really appreciate that everyone put up with me standing on my soapbox for this movie because it's it was important, but it was it was not just globally important. It was important to me to be able to talk about this movie in this way. So I, I just want to say thank you for for letting me have that space. I appreciate it a lot. I was hoping we were going to do some like strangling Easter basket movie next week, you know, from Courtney's favorite director. Yeah. Is there think, one? Killing Easter Bunny. Yeah. I'm going to find one. The can I I just want to add to what Courtney said and and thank you for sharing Courtney because I think it's this movie may, may not be good and it may be the re first rendition that was made but I think that the history needs to be told and we needed to talk about this movie because talking about the Salem witch trials in America is very important for witches to do. Yeah. And I'm yeah. glad that we have you to give us the details and the history alongside all of the other stuff. Cause it's, it's a major player in Hollywood movies and it's a, the story and the legend. And it's a major player in our own American stories that we narrative that we tell ourselves. So, and so, I've gone off on tangents you. before I've gone off on tangents before when we've talked about it, usually on like one or two little topics, but this, this was always going to be the big one. The so elephant. 
yeah thank you for giving me the space to do that and thank you for that research thank you uh, for everything. And I want to thank everybody in the chat room for giving their thoughts, their opinions, because this is, we have freedom of speech here. The people who like it, yes, the people of everything. So thank you. We want this actually to be a place. So wands up for wands up. Wands up for witches. Up for the witches. Wands up for the witches and wands up for those people who were not, who died na as named witches, even though they weren't. Wands up for them. Wands yeah. up. On that moment, it is time, and we have one more thing to do to bring the energy back up. Yeah. One, two, <laughs> three. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> 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 <laughs>